This morning's parable, like any good parable, is one that contains many layers. On the surface, it is a story about money. More traditional translations describe the money that was given to the three different workers as talents. Five talents, two talents, and a single talent. But if we're going to feel the full impact of the parable, we have to understand what a talent was. When we hear about the single talent, the two talents, and the five, we might imagine them to be coins. But it's important to realize that a talent was the equivalent of 15 years wages. That's why this morning's translation describes the money given out to the workers as $2.5 million, $1 million, and half a million dollars. This is important so we understand that the third worker's amount wasn't anything to be ashamed of. They each received extraordinary amounts of money. Two of the workers invested their money and doubled it while the third buried his money. But I believe the story is about more than money. Money is the illustration Jesus uses, but I think maybe the parable's message for us is more than mere cash or bank balances. So if we dig a little deeper, we might think of the money as a metaphor for the gifts and abilities that God has given each of us. Some of us are given more abilities than others, but the, more, but the important thing is what we do with those gifts and abilities. The parable then becomes an illustration about how if we use our talents well, good things will happen, including amazing growth in us as well as in the reign of God. Bury them, leave them unexercised, and we end up out in the cold. So the parable then is about things like responsibility and accountability. It's about putting our resources and the gifts God has blessed us with to good use. But still, I don't think that interpretation exhausts the story's meaning. As I spent some time with this morning's parable, it occurred to me that at least at this point in my life, the point of the parable for me is not really about doubling your money and accumulating wealth. It's about taking action. It's about taking risks. It's about living. And not only is it a parable for you and me as individuals, but I think it's a parable for the church at large because we, like the third worker, can come up with all kinds of excuses for not taking action. One of them is fear. In the parable, the worker said he was afraid of the landowner. He described the landowner as ruthless, and so fearing the landowner's wrath, he went off and buried the money that had been entrusted to him. Now, like most of our fears, his was unfounded. The landowner's behavior with the first and second worker was anything but ruthless or wrathful. In fact, he praised them and invited them to share his joy. Most of our fears are also unfounded. When we step out into the community at large, proud and blessed LGBT Christians, most of us are surprised that the reception we receive isn't nearly as awful as we thought it might be. Oh, sure, there may be. <coughs> There may be some haters out there, but not nearly as many as we anticipated. Because we all want to be welcomed and embraced, fear of rejection can keep us from doing anything at all. <clears throat> and so we become like the third worker, but that's no way to live. That state of doing nothing at all is what I think raised the hackles of the landowner not the lack of return on his money. 
The first two workers doubled the money that was given to them, but I wonder how things would have turned out if they had put the money in a high-risk venture and lost it all. Jesus didn't tell the story that way, but I can't imagine that the landowner would have been harsh toward them. I imagine that he might have even applauded their efforts. At least if we read this parable as being about taking risks and living life instead of a story about accumulating wealth. I think another reason why we might avoid any sort of action is because we make the mistake of comparing ourselves to others. And not just anyone, but we compare ourselves against those who have more resources and who, who we see as having a better shot in life than we do. The parable doesn't say that that's what the third worker did. It doesn't say that he listened to the success story of the first worker who pulled, pulled in $2.5 million in interest or the second worker who scored 100% profit in his investment. It doesn't say it, but I can't imagine him not looking at what he had been given and deciding if he invested his money, it wouldn't amount to anything near to what the other two workers had accomplished. So why bother? If the point of the parable is about numbers and increasing our numbers, then I can sympathize with the third worker. He really would be fighting an uphill battle. But I don't think ministry or God's realm is about increasing numbers, but instead about living life, taking action, and transforming others. And if that's the case, then it doesn't matter how much the worker's investments would have brought in. What matters is that he take a risk what matters is that he take action. What matters is that he live life. I believe our actions impact others. No matter how small the deed, I believe it affects the people around us and sometimes even people we may be totally unaware of. That's called the butterfly effect. It's a scientific theory that a small change in one system can result in large differences in the later system. As the theory goes, something so small and insignificant as the flap of a butterfly's wings can change the air around it in such a way that several weeks later, the time and path of a hurricane might even be influenced. I believe that God calls the church to flap its butterfly wings to make a difference in the world. I believe we are called to do something with the resources that we have been blessed with other than to simply bury them in the ground. And I believe if we are a healthy church, we will constantly be looking for ways to take action. Today our church will take action by participating in the local annual crop hunger walk. And we do it in any of a, num of a number of ways. It might be by donating money, it might be by collecting money from sponsors, or it might be by simply walking in solidarity with the many people all over the world who each day have to walk the same distance, same distance as we will be walking in order to get water from a local river or water well in order to survive. That's one way of taking action. Another way has to do with uniting with other faith communities to end sexual violence. Every two minutes in the U.S. someone is sexually assaulted. One in three women in the U.S. have experienced sexual assault, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. And the number is true for one in four men. As people of faith, we can take action by speaking out and adding our voices to a call to end sexual and gender-based violence. You have in your hands a pledge to that effect. If you fill out the card and place it in the offering basket later on when it's passed, 
we will mail the cards to an organization that will add them to the more than 35,000 signatures that have been collected so far on the Pledge Against Violence. In the back of the sanctuary is another way to take action. You'll see a box for Christmas toys for local children, grandchildren, nieces, and nephews of people living with HIV. Living with the stigma of HIV is bad enough without not having the funds to buy some Christmas, Christmas presents for your loved ones. You can make a difference by picking up an extra toy this year and dropping it in the box. There are many ways to take action. And there are just as many excuses for doing nothing. There's a story from the Desert Fathers in which Abba Lot came to Abba Joseph and said, Father, according as I am able, I keep my little rule and my little fast, my prayer, meditation, and contemplative silence. And according as I am able, I strive to cleanse my heart of thoughts. Now, what more should I do? The elder rose up in reply and stretched out his hands to heaven, and his fingers became like ten lamps of fire. He said, why not become fire? I like this story from the Desert Fathers because becoming fire for me means taking action, taking risks, and living life. It forces me to ask myself questions that I think all of us, you, me, and the church at large, need to ask ourselves. Are we going along doing some fasting and praying and meditation, but not catching fire? Is our faith life more about safety and reassurance and security, or is it about risk-taking and openness and courage? and the unimaginable abundance that comes from these things. Are we willing to let the gospel loose in the world, or are we holding on to it, maybe even keeping it buried? Are we willing to be a blessing to the world? May you and I and the church become fire. May we answer God's call to be an action-oriented people, and may we live life to its fullest. For when we do so, we open ourselves up to the same invitation that the first two workers experienced. We are invited to come and share in God's joy. And can there really be anything better than that? Amen.